Thank you. Yeah, so as uh, the introduction mentioned, this is an abstract that this is one hour condensation of a grad seminar I taught last fall, this past fall. So maybe that already tells you, you know, the level at which you'll get it, but at the same time, very, very condensed. Okay. So uh, machine learning um, is uh, these days uh, basically a form of optimization, as I sketched last time. And so the three things that I'll address today are optimization, So this is an old uh, field at this point, uh, optimization theory, uh, several decades, where people prove convergence rates of algorithms and so on. And uh, what do we know in the context of machine learning? So I'll give a very brief overview. Then I'll talk about generalization. Uh, generalization refers to the magical ability, depending on magical or not, depending on your worldview that you train a machine learning classifier or machine learning algorithm on some data, some finite data set, and then it does fine on data, data that you haven't seen. So that's called generalization, and uh, we'll talk about that. And if I have time at the end, I'll say a little bit about expressivity. Okay, w uh, what are these machine learning algorithms or classifiers or architectures, what are they expressing? and to understand that a little bit. OK, so optimization. Um, so what happens is uh, that uh, the learning problem is expressed as, let's say, minimum of some p of theta where theta is the model parameters. So it's, this is a classic optimization problem. Okay? The, so p is some explicit function, and theta is the parameters. And you're trying to, uh, actually, maybe I'll call it w, because later I'll use w. OK. So, so these are the model parameters, and you're trying to minimize over w this function. So the goodness of a machine learning algorithm is this function. So the standard way in which this is done today is the main algorithm is gradient descent. And in terms of the, the landscape for this w, for, for this P of W, uh, typically the landscape is not convex. So it, this is convex. And if it looks like this, then the old uh, idea of gradient descent just works because it arrives here. And you can bound, upper bound how long it takes to get here. But what we have today is non-convex. So. So now there's obvious issues with gradient descent. If you start here, you'll only end up here. You'll never get there. So this is uh, the difficulty in non-convex. So gradient descent works. This is known classically for convex. And today, also, people uh, often add uh, an acceleration Now, acceleration, is normally, we think of as the second derivative, right? the derivative of the velocity. Uh, and it's related to that, but uh, a little bit different So, in, in practice. So I mean, it's intuitively similar, but in practice, what it means is that you, so gradient descent is w at time t plus 1. The parameters at time t plus 1 is w t minus eta times the gradient of this loss function at wt. So this is gradient descent. And uh, you, eta is what's called the learning rate. And with momentum, uh, 
you know, use not just the gradient of the previous point, but also the gradient information from the last k points. Okay, and it can be shown in the convex case that that speeds up the algorithm. Okay, that's beautiful theory due to, uh, so the, some, buzz, some names here. There's a Nesterov paper from 83, and then the modern versions is Aragrad uh, by people, two of whom are Princeton, uh, Ducci, Hazan, and Singer from 11. Then there's Adam, which is uh, Kingma and, I'm forgetting, Bai and Kingma, I think, um, from 13. So the, these are some of the uh, names in acceleration, accelerated methods, and momentum is yeah, use gradient information <coughs> from previous k steps. Okay, and it can be shown that that accelerates the convex case. So I won't say much more about the convex, but uh, the non-convex. Um, so you may often hear these uh, statements, you know, uh, sort of hand-wringing that machine learning um, algorithms today use non-convex optimization. We don't know how to analyze them, which is true for the big enchilada, deep learning. But um, for other simpler non-convex settings, actually there are, in the last few years, um, several results. And I'll give you a quick overview of that. So uh, so maybe last five years, last five, six years, maybe even seven years, uh, progress in analyzing uh, non-convex optimization. So you have a learning problem where you're uh, solving such kind of problem and it's non-convex. You can do that. Uh, examples, uh, things like uh, uh, matrix completion. And here, uh, even mathematicians like uh, Candice and Tao have been uh, involved in this. Um, topic modeling, that was uh, something that our group did here five, six years ago. Um, Where's matrix completion? Uh, matrix completion is um, uh, you have a matrix, which is low rank, assumed to be low rank. And you're given some entries of it, and you're trying to recover the others. And you have to formulate it uh, um, appropriately so that this is solvable. Now, this can, uh, what the several people showed that was that a convex relaxation of this also uh, you know, gives the right answer under the right conditions. But people have also analyzed just a straightaway non-convex. So why is this non-convex? So you have this matrix, and uh, there's some entries that you don't know. And you're trying to write it as the product of two matrices, so rank R, right? So it's uh, some, let's say this is n by n, so it's n by R times R by n. You're trying to write it as this kind of product, uh, such that this product agrees with this matrix in the entries that you know. Okay, so that's the non-convex. That's non-convex, it turns out, because this, this is, let's say, W1 and this W2. Okay, so this is called matrix completion. Uh, so this people have analyzed. Uh, if you just do gradient descent on the non-convex objective, uh, it, it can be shown to work. But there are other similar things, topic modeling, which is, which is actually a different algorithm. It's not gradient descent. Uh, tensor decomposition, uh, which is also not exactly gradient descent, uh, although now people are analyzing gradient descent on it. Uh, uh, learning hidden Markov models, et cetera. So there are some, uh, oh, dictionary uh, sparse coding or dictionary learning. This was, again, something that our group did. Uh, 
tensor decomposition means uh, uh, decompose of tensor product to representations? That's right. You can, you can do that with optimization? That's right. Wow. Yeah, you should mention that that's some assumptions about it. I was going to say, I was going to say, yeah. Uh, right, so this is just uh, analog matrix factorization, but for tensors. Yeah, so realize that in machine learning, all the computations are approximate. So even matrix factorization is really you know, based on singular values and so on, right? because uh, it's all approximate. So, uh, so it's similar for tensor. You know, it's not a linear algebraic problem, almost. It's really an optimization problem. Uh, OK, so the important thing here, which Avi was alluding to, is that uh, we know the, the important thing here is that we know the function uh, p uh, and, and the distribution it comes from. Okay, so um, you know, an example of this, this, not, not, this is a simple example, you know, knowing what distribution comes from. Like being able to do some linear algebra, let's say singular value decomposition, on a worst case matrix versus on a random matrix. Right? Intuitively, those could be very different, right? They could have very different complexities. Okay, so the random matrix, you know, has a lot more structure that you can exploit. So there's something analogous going on here. I mean, it's not a simple random matrix, but it is these are all problems, matrices, or tensors with very specific structure. And you make those assumptions, and then it can work. Okay, similarly, topic modeling and so on. So when we get to deep learning in a minute, yeah, that is not true, that we don't know the distribution. Okay, so this is actually a very fundamental issue here, uh, which I'll keep emphasizing as I talk about uh, deep learning. So how do these analyses of, uh, of, uh, of these non-convex algorithms work? Well, you are in some landscape like this, and you're showing that the algorithm works. So what better be true? I mean, what, what's the only logical way in which you could proceed? I'm trying to actually get your ideas, because I know there are some high-powered mathematicians here. And I'm hoping maybe there's something we are missing, some way of analysis that maybe we haven't thought of. So how would you, how would you ever prove a result like this? That you know, there's some non-convex problem, kind of like what I mentioned. And you do gradient descent, and you end up at the optimum, the, the solution you were looking for. What's the only possible way this could work? I mean, how could this I'd add noise, start bouncing around. Random, random, uh, okay, so that's a physics notion, yes. So, uh, okay, so good. So I was completely forgetting that, but of course. So the physicists have long known about these problems, and they have these uh, notions of, you know, this temperature-based temperature sampling is what you're referring to, I think, that at a high temperature, the particle, you're sort of following a particle in this landscape, and at a high temperature, initially you think the temperature is high, which means it's very jittery, and so it sort of can explore a lot, and then you slowly cool, and you're hoping that it sort of settles into the low energy region. So that's a physics way. And that people have uh, explored again uh, in some of these settings. So indeed, yeah, that is another way, uh, which is kind of like a perturbed gradient descent. So that's fine, yeah. OK, so that's one method. Uh, another one. Have to be close enough. Have to get close, right? So. So there's some landscape. So this is a proof sketch sketch. I don't know, sketch of a sketch of a proof sketch, OK? Um, there's some landscape. It's not convex. And because you know the problem, right, that the distribution it comes from and so on, you have, you, you know, this problem was generated using some solution, essentially. So there's some correct solution here, W star. And the uh, analysis shows that at every step, the direction of motion is correlated with where you want to go to. Right? So if 
you are going in an uncor negative correlated direction, you are going away. But if you are positively correlated, you are headed roughly in the right direction, right? So that's it. So that's, that's what all these uh, results do. I mean, that's not the way they express it, but at some point, uh, uh, you know, my student Teng Yuma and I, now uh, uh, he's graduated, uh, were interested in looking at what these algorithms were doing, and Teng Yu looked at half a dozen or more papers and established that that's essentially they could be phrased like this. Okay, so you, because you know this landscape, you know what distribution came from, you know the distribution of solutions, whatever you're looking for, you can mathematically prove that the direction that the algorithm is moving in uh, correlates with the direction you want to go to. And this depends on the choice of the learning grade? All of that, yeah. So the algorithm may not be even just a vanilla gradient descent, yeah, but it's, it has a flavor of gradient descent, and it's trying to go there. So all the mathematicians here, if you know, like from, I don't know, differential equations, dynamical systems, anything, PDs, if you know of other ways to prove that you're getting to the right place, I'm very eager to hear that. OK. Um, yeah, so, but this is obviously up and no function. Uh, so I would, yeah, love to chat. Like, what else? Yeah, what other kinds of, so yeah, a Lyapunov function, yeah, in general, you could have a function of this, but, yeah. Is there a result based on conductance of the return? That, that's the one uh, Mark mentioned, the physics ar argument. Yeah, so we have the simulator. Yeah, we, we, I mentioned that, yeah, function. which is very different, yeah. Oh, no, it's noisy gradient descent, yeah. Yeah, but there's the analysis uses estimates on the conductance of the Yes. Good. Escape probability. That's fundamentally different. Yeah, that's the physics. Yeah. The random walk view. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So each particle, right. It's not that each particle is moving in the right direction, but the sort of swarm of particles. Yeah, you can just escape from any bad region. Right. So th we'll get to those kinds of algorithms too. People have done that here. Um, and the okay, so let's see how deep learning is different. So remember that there is a input which lets, uh, and then there's layers, and then there's an output. So let's call the layers W1, W2, etc. WH, H is the depth, all WH, yeah, and uh, the input is, let's say, X1. And so WI plus one is equal to ReLU, which is some Nonlinear operator, I'll say in a second, of wi times x, x, xi. Oh, sorry, what am I doing? Not the depth. xi plus 1 is equal to ReLU of. So, what is this? So, you apply the previous layer. So, to get the, the, the vector at layer xi plus 1, at layer i plus 1, you apply the the transformation of the previous layer on the vector at the previous layer, and then do this coordinate-wise nonlinearity, which is called ReLU, which is a differentiable function like this. So this is okay, x. Maybe you say that w i is the matrix. That's right. Uh, so w i is a matrix. Okay. This is just a linear transformation. So you apply a linear transformation on the previous layer, and uh, then you apply coordinate-wise nonlinearity, which is a very simple nonlinearity, this function. It's differentiable except here. Okay, it's continuous, and it's differentiable except here. So it's ba that's why it's used. It's basically differentiable everywhere. And so 
you can compute the gradient and it doesn't vanish. OK, so uh, this is a deep net. So now uh, th there's some output. Uh, let's call it xh plus 1, no, x1, xh. And uh, there's a loss function. OK, so what are we given? We're given training data. OK, so, uh, so some uh, x1, which is the input and the label. OK, this is the label. So for example, the input could be images, and the label is you are interested in labeling cars versus trucks. So that's the label. So that's the training data, so a bunch of these. And now the loss is sum over x, uh, x1, y1 uh, in data of, let's say, the true output xh minus y. OK, something like that. So this is some label. And this is a true output and the L2 loss. OK? So don't think too hard about my notation. Just, yeah, I mean, it's some function of the true label and the label it's producing. But this should look like, this loss function should look like P of W. Right, so this is the P of W. So this is P of W, right? Because this x is itself. Basically, you know, when you unwrap this, is some function of w1 through w, wh, and x, x1 and y1. Because this is just a function like that. Okay, so now you have a function of the parameters. Okay, and these are constants. Right? Because all the data is given to you. So these are really constants in this. And these are the parameters. OK, and now you uh, train this via gradient descent. And I mentioned in my uh, fall lecture that there is this algorithm uh, called backpropagation. Gradient of f, uh, you do backpropagation. Yeah, you would think of this as a circuit, which is converting the input to the output. And this backpropagation algorithm uses that circuit structure to do this gradient computation efficiently. OK, so now here, what do we not know? This function includes these, these quantities, which we really don't understand. It's just some empirical stuff, right? Images and labels. But what's the distribution these images come from? You know, something analogous to you know random matrices, hierarchical something or the other hierarchical random matrix something, right? Some clean mathematical model. We just don't have that. So this is, as far as math is concerned, is just some object. And so these are the constants in this in in the way you've written down this function, and so we have no idea what this landscape is. Okay, that's why. Those techniques that I mentioned don't apply here. So those have been developed because we are curious to explore non-convex optimization, but these are for non-convex functions that we understand. And we don't understand these. OK, but yeah, a long-term goal is to actually understand maybe. Uh, I mean, maybe there's some other way to do this math. But it seems like the only way to do that math is to understand what these image distributions are which seems like a very difficult task. But it's also something I'm very interested in. And if I get time, I'll talk about it at the end. Any questions? Are you going to say more about backpropagation? What do you mean by backpropagation? OK. So it's just an algorithm to computing the gradient, right? And uh, wh what's the structure of this uh, function? Yeah, it's just uh, composition of functions, right? They supply. To, so you use chain rule. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, if you were to write chain rule just naively, like if you just took two, two minutes to write it down, it would be computationally less efficient. It would take time quadratic in the number of variables here. And the number of variables here is like a few million these days. So that would be just too much because you'd be doing this gradient a lot of times. So, but if you sit down and thought hard, like some people did 30 years ago, you'd come up with a better algorithm using dynamic programming. And that's backpropagation. And that, that works in time linear in the number of coordinates. OK, n linear in the number of these individual parameters, the edges. Is it an approximation, though? It's an exact computation. Exactly. Yeah. And it's linear time. Yeah, there are related algorithms that exist in like Avi's end of uh, research as well, which are very similar. Yeah, so this fact has been known for 30, 35 years. OK, so uh, I have a blog post about it if you would like. Uh, nobody has written down a very clean version of that, so I try to do that when I taught my undergrad class. OK, so uh, all right, so now we, now we have to deal with, you know, if you want to do theory here, we have to deal with this issue that we don't understand this landscape. Um, OK, so what are the things? So we don't understand what the global optimum is. So, so perhaps should, uh, so for uh, theory uh, questions, OK, first cut. Well, what does the gradient uh, following algorithm do? Well, it keeps going until the gradient is 0, right? So you should, you should understand the time taken to, to reach point where gradient uh, of p is equal to 0, a critical point. So you could try to understand this. And this is actually, so OK, so that's the first cut. Let's just do that. Now, uh, that's not a sufficient condition to be even a local optimum. So in two dimensions, maybe that's not clear. But in three dimensions, you could al al already have places where the gradient is 0. But if you look at the second order information, you see that you know it's a saddle point. So, so time taken to reach a local optimum. OK? This is sometimes uh, phrased as avoid saddle points So th these are things that people have done. Yeah. So is it, uh, can we assume that if we do this thing for a single layer value, then we can just extend it for multi real layers? Do what this? Do these two things, or just for one value, just one layer? Uh, a one layer network. Yeah, just suppose instead of W1, W2, you just have one, one layer. I think with one layer, I think people try to aim higher, which is to reach the global optimum, <laughs> uh, because it's simpler. But yeah, so I mean, we already know how to do this for multi-layer, which I was going to sketch now. Okay. Yeah. OK, so how do you analyze these things? So really, in this field, we are, at the fa we are in a state where convex optimization was you know, 30, 40 years ago, or maybe more. Uh, which is that we're just you know, playing around with the relative norms of gradients and Hessians and so on. Okay? And then you can get some bounds. So this one is not so hard. So, so you know, if uh, under, you, you would imagine that under appropriate conditions, you can get some, uh, that these functions, oh, uh, so I've, I'm now calling the function f. You know, there's some bound on you know the smoothness of the Hessian or of the uh, of the gradient, etc. 
So you make these assumptions, okay? So we don't know what these constants are, but there's some, some numbers that depend on the network. So now, in terms of these numbers, you can give some kind of convergence bound. And how does that go? So something like this, f of x t plus 1 is less than or equal to f of x t plus the gradient of f of x t times x t plus 1 minus x t. Uh, plus L over 2 times x t plus 1 minus x t squared. Okay, so this is just by integration. So if there's a bound on the norm of the second derivative, then you know it can't increase too fast. So when you take a gradient step, you know uh, you you make progress intuitively. I mean that's what the second order information tells you that the the um, the gradient doesn't shift on you too, too rapidly, right? I, this must be familiar to most people who thought about such things. So, so that's it. So, so then you do that, and then by appropriate choice of choice of uh, eta, which balances the two constants, you know, uh, you get uh, this is less than or equal to f of x t minus 1 over 2 eta of uh, uh, x t plus 1 minus x t square. OK, so you, uh, you are guaranteed to make progress at every step, OK? So long as the gradient remains large. When the gradient drops, then you're already done, OK? So we're just trying to get not to gradient actually less equal to zero, but like where the gradient of p has norm less than or equal to epsilon. So that's what we do. Okay. So so using this gradient following method under some conditional second derivative, you can get there in some bounded time, which depends on these constants, the Lipschitz constants. So that's this. Now this is a little bit harder, and let me tell you the issue. So we have a point where the gradient is small. The, but it's not a local optimum. OK, so that means that the Hessian, the second order matrix, uh, is, uh, sorry, is, uh, is not positive semi-definite. Okay, so we are assuming that it's not happening, yeah. That this function is sort of, by some perturbation, is not, doesn't have any degeneracies. There's various asterisks, yeah. So, so we want to avoid these kinds of points. And so let's assume, again, since we're interested only in sort of converging not to zero, but close to zero. So you just assume that gradient of f is, uh, is okay so we're looking for points so looking for for this and the gradient of f is bigger than or equal to some minus gamma times identity so so it's not positive semi definite but it's almost positive semi definite so now uh, turns out that perturbed gradient descent Uh, avoids, uh, you know, finds points like this. And this is a paper of uh, Ge, Jin, and Yang from maybe 15. How does it depend on the dimension? 
Right. So the point uh, here is that you know you, uh, it is actually a subtle algorithm because the 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 Hessian is telling you that there is a direction which you should which exists, but you're in high dimensions. In high dimensions, there's just too many directions, and so to find this one needle in a haystack is not easy. Okay, and this proof is indeed not completely trivial. To to show that somehow a perturbed gradient descent where you take the gradient and add some noise to it, that that uh, gets uh, you know avoids the bad points. Yeah, 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 it is linear. That's right. Uh, and there have been actually n plus improvements. There are some recent improvements. There's been a series of papers since then. OK, so that's what we know about optimization. OK, that, that's basically it, that people have analyzed these kinds of algorithms and uh, you know, can guarantee uh, arriving at some version of Optima. Oh, there's another um, thing I forgot to mention that people believe, and there have been papers suggesting this, uh, based on some physics kinds of intuition. So these are not rigorous things. Uh, physics intuitions in very toy models that may be very, that let me put a lot of uh, um, uh, cautions there. But based on that, people have suggested that it's enough to reach local Optima. The local Optima. Most local optima are fine. Are close in value to the global. Uh, uh, yeah, are just as good also, as. Also, I think it isn't clear in other areas that the global has more generalization than some of the. Good. So right. generalization. Let's get to that. Yeah. Next topic. Yeah. So in practice, uh, when you're training um, your your deep learning system, do you um, use these perturbed gradient gradient descents throughout, or do you? Excellent wait? question. Right. So then what's a good algorithm? Is it gradient descent or perturbed gradient descent? So, uh, so it's believed that the normal gradient descent that we do, the version we do, is already in some sense perturbed and has a lot of noise. So this is supposed to be an allegory about what's happening with that algorithm. So why is that algorithm noisy? So it, notice that the function depends on data, right? And data is like a million images. So just computing this function or the gradient is very costly. Okay, we have great GPUs and stuff, but still it's very costly. So what people do is do a sample of the data at every step. So instead of taking all the million data points, take like 256 data points or whatever. And that's a sample of the gradient, which in the expectation is correct by linearity of expectations. But uh, it's not the true gradient. So anyway, it's believed that the gradient is noisy. So actually, there's a lot of other theory, which I should have mentioned maybe. Uh, based on that insight, you know, that you think that the gradient is kind of noisy, and then indeed you can do these physics proofs, uh, which you know, are not rigorous, but which gives all kinds of other insight about the speed of convergence and various things that people are interested in, like batch normalization and various things. Yeah, so there's been a string of papers about that as well. Yeah, but this perturbed uh, gradient also relates very nicely to the physics ideas like the Langevin Monte Carlo and so on, and maybe there's going to be more developments there. No, but you cannot bound. You have to assume the bound. Sorry? You have to assume the bound. No, no, for deep nets. Yeah, but it's already much more general results. Than oh, yeah, I agree. So you can, you can make some other assumption which is weaker and, yeah, do better, yeah. But you have to assume it. Even this is being assumed, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, right. OK, so, yeah. Um, so why do we need to assume a lower bound over eigenvalues? Like, um, you know that there isn't there isn't a very obvious way to decrease. Yeah, but that would be like saying that the like you have to have negative. Let, let's do it offline. Yeah, yeah, I can describe to you. I, I also have lecture notes. Yeah, so uh, but we can talk. Okay, so let me talk about generalization. Running a little late. Uh,
So generalization. Um, so it's something we've been working on in the last uh, couple of months, uh, Ben Am and I and some co-authors. So. Um, OK, what's the main, uh, recall what I said. Generalization is uh, the phenomenon that you train a classifier like this one with some data. And then it does well on unseen data. Now, just if you think of this as some kind of, you know, if you approach it using, just in terms of curve fitting, as, a, as an intuition, using intuition from curve fitting, the surprising thing is that the number of parameters today uh, today uh, could be like in the tens of millions. Okay, so now you're trying to, f in some sense, do curve fitting with this many parameters. So how many data points would you imagine you need? More than the number of, uh, 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 more than the number of parameters, right? That's what you'd imagine. Otherwise, there are some trivial curves that fit all the data. Well, surprisingly, can even train using uh, tens of thousands, or say 60K, 60K examples in some cases. So that's really uh, considered strange, that somehow these millions of parameters don't overfit, you know, that they don't come up with some trivial solution which just describes the data and nothing else. Somehow the net that you learn, these Ws, uh, learn the underlying distribution in some way, and they generalize to unseen data. So that's a mystery. OK, so let's, uh, let's see. Let's first understand the issue using linear classifiers. Uh, AKA a single layer, one layer. Number. Right, this we understand very well. Um, so what is this? So you have just one vector, w, and the input is x, and the output is a sine of w dot x. So that's a linear classifier. So it turns out that even here, you can train for the natural learning problems. You can train a classifier with, say, 100,000 parameters and just train using 10,000 examples. So it's very surprising here, too. So here, what happens is that when people actually look in there at what, you've, what classifier you've trained, there's something, a phenomenon called margin. So margin is gamma if. So there's input x, so the data consists of x and y, where this is the label, is gamma if, uh, if uh, y times sine of w dot x is at least gamma. So pictorially, what is the saying? That this is a, a linear classifier corresponds to a hyperplane, w dot x. And why, so how far you are from, you know, if, if you are on the positive side, the, classifier, uh, the answer is, is plus 1. And if you're on this side, it's minus 1. And what this is saying is that the points are such that this x, y, this label, plus minus 1, uh, when you when you compute w dot x, sorry, x, x is the point here. When you look at w dot x, it's, it's not just positive. You know, the answer was plus 1. It's not just positive, but it's actually gamma. 
Okay, it's somewhat far from the margin, uh, from the hyperplane. So this is called the margin. So in other words, the data is not just, uh, the, you know, the plus ones are not just separated from minus ones by hyperplane, but by this fat slab. Okay, so that, when you do the, when you look at these data sets where linear classification works, you find some kind of margin. Okay, and now, uh, okay, so that's called margin. Sorry, so are you saying it's a property of the data, perhaps not of the algorithm? Data. Uh, of the data, yeah. Right, I mean, that there exists a classifier, that's right, that's what I'm suggesting. Right, it suggests it works independently of the details of the algorithm. It probably also depends on the algorithm, yeah. In fact, there's good evidence that some uh, optimization algorithms generalize worse than others, yeah. For, for linear classifiers, yeah. So but what's the extension for deep nets? That's what I was going to get to, yeah. But for linear networks, yeah, this is the explanation people have come up with. Um, so w let's just try to understand the issue here. So, you know, why, what you have to do mathematically. So there's some uh, loss function, summation over i, which is data, of loss w, xi, yi. Okay, so this is the data, this is the label. So this is, uh, or maybe you can do one over the n. n is the data size. So the average loss. Okay, this loss is uh, over there, something like that. So this is the empirical loss. And you want this to be less than equal to uh, sorry, uh, the other way. So this is the empirical loss. So you want this to this. So this is, you know, here you've optimized W, so it's as small as you could make it, plus epsilon is less than equal to the, the expected loss X and Y of loss of W, X, Y. So let me explain this. So in generalization theory, you assume that the data and the labels were drawn from some distribution. Okay, that existed. Now that's a little bit problematic because maybe images on Twitter today is a different distribution than the images tomorrow, right? So there's no invariant distribution probably. Philosophically, is a, a little bit of a problem. But assuming that all the images or whatever data you have came from the same distribution and were independent draws from it, then this is what you are interested in, right? This is what, this is the, called the test error. And this is the train, the empirical loss, or test loss. So you want to prove this. Now, when you first look at it, it seems like this is just concentration bounds, right? That this was the, uh, the average over the distribution, and this is the empirical average. Just use concentration bounds. Benham? Benham is the, am I making a mistake? It's correct, right? If you, if you get a huge loss, you satisfy this exit, a huge yeah. empirical loss, you satisfy yeah. No, that's what you want. Sorry, this is what you want. You don't want a large loss. Less than an equal. It's less than an equal. Am I making it? No, it's correct, right? Yeah. Even assume this is zero. Even assume this is zero. On the data, you can predict perfectly. You want to predict not too badly on the position. Yeah. That's right. Well, it's not concentration, right? So why is it not concentration? Why is it not concentration? We don't know the distribution. No. W depends on the data. Depends on sample. So concentration bounds only apply when you have some function which has been fixed in advance, and then you are evaluating that function on the distribution versus on the on the samples. But here, 
this function, namely this w, depends upon the sample. Okay, therefore concentration bounds, naive concentration bounds don't work. N no, I don't think so. So, this maybe okay for linear maybe okay so linear you can yeah linear classifiers you can analyze in half a dozen ways if not two dozen um, but yeah in general it doesn't work okay so um, so that's what you have to show okay so the only way the concentration bounds can work is that you have to take a union bound over all possible W's. And here again, uh, yeah, I would love to uh, get the mathematicians' feedback on, are we missing something here? Because, you know, maybe this is too pessimistic, all possible Ws. So maybe there's something going on here. But anyway, so you do, uh, you have to do the union bound on all possible Ws. And that's why this margin helps. Because the number of, uh, number of vectors in, in, in Rn, Right, or unit vectors in Rn um, is approximately exponential of n, something like that. Okay, if you discretize. But number of uh, uh, these gamma margin vectors, distinct vectors, is only proportional to n to the gamma square or something like that okay so so that's why you know this union bound is much more favorable for these okay so that's linear classifiers any questions So how do we analyze for neural nets? So I have not a lot of time. I'll tell you the main idea. So there are these papers, uh, so extending to neural nets. So I'll describe to you some work uh, of uh, this uh, Nesha Burera, Benham here. And Benham actually did his uh, thesis on it and has several excellent papers. Uh, but the, I'm referring to the latest one. And then Bartlett et al. OK, uh, but what I'm going to describe to you is my view of it, and you know, what we've been thinking about, and which leads to nice generalization. No, nice extension. Let me not call it generalization of this work. So the idea is what? So you want some kind of an extension of this argument uh, so that instead of doing a union bound over all possible parameter vectors, you're doing a union bound over a much smaller set. OK, so um, the idea in this, so they, formally it's something called pack based bounds. And when you first see it, it's very hard to get intuition for them. And maybe, uh, actually, it's more general than what I'm, I'll talk about. But the way it's applied, these pack based bounds, these are by McAllister, 99. Let me tell you intuitively what it says. So it says that you have this network, uh, not what that says, but the way people apply the pack based bound. So there's some neural network W. And now you, uh, you do the fo so you do the following thought experiment. So to understand that thought experiment, I forgot to say something here. So what, there's something that margin also says. So margin also means is sort of equivalent to uh, that W of x is approximately W of x plus noise. Or actually, do, can do the other way too. W of x is approximately equal to W plus noise times x. 
OK, by noise, I mean Gaussian noise, coordinate-wise. So w is a, is a vector, coordinate-wise Gaussian noise. If you add coordinate-wise Gaussian noise, uh, what do you get? The expectation of noise times x is 0. And expectation of noise times x square is, is the variance. Uh, assume that uh, x is a unit vector. Right? So the effect of noise is to shift this value a little bit. Right? And the margin says that it's stable to that noise. Agreed? So this margin notion, the w dot x, you know, uh, the, the sign of it uh, you know, agrees with, uh, with, the, with the label. You know, it's, it, that mar the existence of margin just says that if you add noise to w, the answer is roughly stable. Okay. So now uh, you try to do something similar here. So w is a trained neural net. You do the following thought experiment, w plus noise. And for now, noise just means for each edge in the neural net, add some Gaussian noise. Add a Gaussian noise here on the weight of the edge. So now, if these two are roughly the same, if w and w plus eta are roughly the same. Uh, meaning they have the same output. Then the sample the number of training samples needed is less than or equal to something that some function of the w and the variance of uh, divided by the variance of eta. Okay, so uh, let me call it the greater the noise that you can add to W without affecting the output, the better your upper bound on the training samples. It's completely analogous to that, right? The bigger the margin, the more the noise you can add to W without changing its output very much, and the better your. Uh, by the way, here the number of samples is log of this number. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the method used. So now this is so this is a big if, right? So do train neural nets satisfy this property. So they do experiments, Ben Am and also the other group, and they find that this is true. OK? And so from that, you get some kind of a bound. The bad news is that from their technique, the bound you get on the number of samples, it's still more than the number of true parameters. I, I can't really explain how that happens, but that happens. OK? So it's an interesting idea, but currently, it doesn't give you better bounds. Than the knife, much worse. Okay, he's even more honest. Okay, but it's a very interesting idea. So, what do we do? I, I guess out of time. So our idea. Okay, so this is just uh, the input-output behavior. You feed an input here, and then you get an output, and you want this output to be stable to this noise. So our idea is that. Uh, you know, each layer, so this is a hypothesis. If, so there's another if, if each layer is fairly stable to noise injection at every, at earlier layers. So this is an, another new if. But it's a stronger form of noise stability. It's not just that the output is stable, but every layer is fairly stable. OK? So if that is true, then you get a better generalization bound, much better. OK, the generalization bound meaning the number of samples. 
number of samples needed so that your performance on the training data generalizes to test data. So, uh, so generalization. Generalization. So that's the idea. And I, I guess I have less time than I thought. Um, maybe I'll just, if, if I can take one more minute to explain at least their idea, and then I'll stop. So what's the idea? You know, if you have a matrix W, uh, which, so now just look at one layer. And W has a property that W times X is roughly W plus noise times X. Multi-output, multi yes. Um, this already suggests that uh, W is approximately low rank. Because what, what, what is a, so this is just a, a random matrix, right? You're adding a random matrix to W. What does it do? It sort of smears out the lower eigenvalues or singular values and leaves, uh, leaves uh, if, you know, depending on the level of noise, leaves a higher uh, singular values roughly unchanged. So that's what adding a random matrix with the appropriate, no uh, with the appropriate uh, uh, norm to W does. Okay? It sort of smears out the, the computation of W on, along the direction of the lower singular values and preserves it on the higher singular values. So if this is the case, then it must be that most of the signal, y, uh, most of the signal, so th they must exist uh, large singular values or singular values. Uh, and those directions carry the signal. Right, X is coming out of some distribution in this case. So X is, uh, you know, drawn from the uh, real life images and it, it's, you know, the previous layers compute on it. So, and then it hits this layer. And there we're saying that it's stable to noise. It, it turns out that some thought shows that there must exist large singular values in W. And those are the directions, the corresponding directions that carry the signal in X, where X has most of its norm. Okay, and so it's roughly like a low rank matrix and so it can be compressed. Okay, so, so you get this because the W can be compressed. That's what we show. Okay, so if the, so it's a more strong version of what was going on earlier that uh, under this noise stability condition, uh, W is compressible. Now, OK, I, I forgot to say this. This is not a new discovery, that W is compressible. People are doing that already, all the time, because the practitioners are very interested in using trained deep nets. Like you train it with tons of GPUs, and you get this, this trained net. And now they want to compress it to use it in your smartphone so that it uses less. So they've been doing the tricks that we come up with. We know they work, right, empirically, because we know about this work. OK? but this theoretical assumption sort of makes it more rigorous why this works. So I'll stop here and the thing I didn't do today which I was hoping to have, uh, have five ten minutes for was uh, understanding the structure of data. So remember that what the uh, data is we don't understand. So people are very interested in coming up with generative models, so probabilistic generative models for data, like real life images, real life text. This is going to be very complicated, but you use a multi-layer deep net with millions of parameters, okay? And you hope that that can represent the data. So that's called deep generative models. And um, yeah, just to give you some buzzwords, it's deep generative models. Uh, and more recently, uh, generative adversarial nets. And uh, again, here there's some theory work that we've done. And again, maybe a good starting point is my blog. Uh, 
of convex.org, uh, which, uh, yeah, uh, Nishit is also a, uh, what's the term for it? Co runner? I don't know what, co organizer of this blog. So, yeah, there's uh, uh, introductory articles about these things on the blog. So, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.